Welcome to The Living Word. I'm Dave Dino, and we're visiting with Pastor John Carter. Today, we're going to have the opportunity to sit down with Pastor and ask him the questions that perhaps you may have always wanted to ask and to have answers to. Our questions are going to range on everything from the Bible to the Gospel to the Trinity, questions that really get down into the heart of your faith. Pastor, I'm really so happy to be with you and to talk about these so issues So glad today. to be here, Dave. Let's begin right out of the chute, and let's ask you the question that I think should be important to each and every one of us as Christians, and that is, what is your view of the Bible? I believe it's, the, it's a revelation of the will of God. I don't believe that the Bible contains the Word of God. I believe it is the Word of God. Mm. But the Word of God written in the words of men. I don't believe in the dictation theory where God said, write down this, 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 and this, but I believe God put the thoughts in the minds of human beings. They were divine thoughts and they wrote them down with human utterances. But I believe for all of that, it is the Word of God. The different views of the Bible that are out there within religion, Christian religions, we'll keep ourselves in that general category for a moment. What would be some of the different views that are out there and why would they be held? Well, there's the dictation theory that I just alluded to. That means that God told them every word to write down. And so the very words were dictated by God. Mm -hmm. There's a problem there as far as I'm concerned because that would indicate that God didn't know his grammar. When you get into the book of uh, Revelation, the author got so excited that he got his grammar mixed up. <laughs> and so I, I don't think God gets his grammar mix, mixed up. I think the Bible is a combination of the divine and the human. And then there's the other extreme. That's the liberal viewpoint, Dave, where people say, well, you know, it's a pretty good book. It's the best we've got and it's the best we can uh, find. But, you know, it's, it's basically just a human book and it simply reflects the culture and the ideas of its time. I don't believe that. I believe that archaeology and other sciences, if we could use those terms, mm. indicate that this is more than a human book, that while it is a human book, it reflects the mind of God, and it teaches infallible truths. The pendulum swings all the way from the Word of God, the Bible, is the infallible Word of God, mm -hmm. all the way over to others who say, well, it is nothing more than a biased narrative of history. Yes. Mm, pious collection of myths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and based on some other previous myths that, hey, look, we can find a similarity between this story and some other story in a culture that came several hundred years before. What do you yes. say to people that bring those things up? I say it isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave, I, I have made, by the grace of God, an intensive study of this book. Mm. Uh, like you, I've read it through, not once, but I, I've read it through time after time. Mm -hmm. I've gone to the places where it was written. I've explored the places that are mentioned in this book, the archaeological sites. Uh, we've gone to Ur and all the places in Palestine and all the places in Egypt. You see, this book was born in the land of Egypt. And when you go and compare the, the narrative that is found in the Bible with the archaeological records of, of those ancient people, it becomes apparent that this is not just a collection of pious myths, that this is indeed an authentic historical document. That's important. If I want to have faith in my Bible and in yes. what it says, as a pastor, what guidelines would you give me in how to really believe that what I'm reading is indeed the truth of God? Uh, it's a great question, Dave. I don't believe in the uh, idea of faith in faith. People say, well, just have faith. Uh. I, I don't believe in this because you can have faith in, in error. You can have faith in lies. I mean, a lie is not the truth simply because you have faith in it, is mm -hmm. it? That's right. Some people say, well, if you believe it, really believe it, then it is the truth for you. That's not true. A lie is a lie is a lie is a mm -hmm. lie. And the truth is the truth is the truth. Now, there is evidence in this book that is, all, well, that is no, not almost overwhelming, is overwhelming. There is overwhelming evidence that this book, book is authentic. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me give you some illustrations just off the top of my head. Not long ago, I was in Iraq, the land of Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein. Mm -hmm. That's the old land of Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. While I was there, I went to the old city of Babylon. Marvelous old city. It's mentioned all the way through the Bible. It has been said that the Bible is a tale of two cities, the city of Babylon and the city of Jerusalem. 
But when you go to Babylon, you find tremendous evidence that there is, there is historical evidence that substantiates the claims of the Bible. Let me give you, now I'm just taking this off the top of my head because these questions are coming from you off the top of your head, I believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take the story of Belshazzar. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that Belshazzar, in the book of Daniel it says here that the, the king Belshazzar was the last king of the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. But historical sources independent of the Bible say, no, the last king of Babylon was Nabonidus. Mm -hmm. And so skeptics said for many, many years, here is a classical case that this book is wrong. But then archaeologists found a little, little inscription that I have actually studied hmm. where it says that Nabonidus had a son and his son was Belshazzar. Ah. And even though Nabonidus was the official king of Babylon, he got sick of the, of the rat race. And so he left Babylon and went up to his summer home and he went into early retirement because he had a good social security plan. And he placed on the throne of Babylon his son, Belshazzar, exactly as the Bible says. So there's just one little historical story. Then you can go in the same land of, of uh, Babylonia and Mesopotamia, you can go to Nineveh. Hmm. You can see there the ruins of Nineveh. It was so lost to the world for thousands of years, the skeptics said there was no such place. But the Bible says it would be destroyed, it would be lost, it would be made desolate. You can go and climb the walls of Nineveh today and you discover, Dave, it's in the very condition the Bible writers said it would be in thousands of years ago. John, it's just a little bit of evidence. You are a biblical archaeologist. You are known in one of your roles as a biblical archaeologist. It must be very exciting to you to read about biblical and archaeological discoveries, discoveries that prove or show or yes. confirm or yes. are in line with what the Bible says. Yes. And, and there is literally a ton of evidence. I was in a place in Israel not very long ago and archaeologists had unearthed a big stone. Now, so what? Big old stone. Mm -hmm. But by using all types of methods of dating, they were able to prove that this stone was a certain stone which was mentioned in the Bible at the crowning of a certain king. Wow. It said that this king was crowned on this certain stone. Uh, I was there, I, I said to the scholars there, now is, is, uh, how can you, well we know, we know by the dating. And uh, it's got the inscriptions on it. So this shows that the Bible is true. Yes, it's certainly true as far as this is concerned, yes. Then you go to the New Testament and you go to the city of Caesarea and there you can find there the Pilate inscription that talks about Pilate. And the Bible talks about Pilate as being the Ro Roman governor who had Jesus Christ put to death. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just touching on just one or two points. There are hundreds, there are thousands of points. Throughout the history of the church, there have been yes. certain creeds that have been formulated, and they've all been designed in one way or another to try to define the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel comes from the Greek word for good news, mm -hmm. not good advice. Despite a million sermons, to the contrary, that say that the gospel is good advice. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this, do, 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 cock a doodle do. The gospel is not good advice telling you what to do or even what to be. The gospel is good news. It is good news about what, is, what God has done for us. Mm -hmm. And the gospel is the good news, number one, that we have a God in heaven. Mm -hmm. And this God made us. I have te taught these truths and preached these truths to hundreds of thousands and millions of Russians who were brought up in atheism. And when I say, I have good news for you, you're not a machine, you're not an animal, you're not a thing. You are a child of God. You are special, you are distinct, you are unique. You are not a cousin to a monkey. You didn't come down from the trees. You came from the hand of God. You're not simply the product of time plus matter plus chance. That's what people say, you see. Man is simply the product. If you have enough time, and if you have enough matter, and if you have enough chance, and if you shake them all together, mm -hmm. after a while you get a human being. So it's all a big accident. But the, the idea is this. If man came on the world seen by accident, he's going to exit by accident. I don't believe this. There are no accidents in the plan of God. 
We came from the hand of a loving creator, God, who made the universe. Did you know this, Dave? I'm excited about astronomy. I'm excited about astronomy. They've discovered that when the universe was made, you had these certain great forces. Now, I'm not a scientist, but one of those great forces was the force of gravitation. That's the force that pulls you down. Mm -hmm. Makes you feel like staying in bed in the morning. Mm. Gravitation. Then there's a force of pushing out. There are four of these great forces. Scientists have recently discovered, now this is amazing, that if those forces had been out by one quadrillionth, can you think of it? One quadrillionth of one percent, the universe could not have produced life. If those forces had been out by one quadrillionth of one percent, the universe would either have collapsed or expanded out with such speed the stars could not have formed. And there would not have been a human race. There would not have been worlds. And that is why physicists today by the score are saying we can no longer be atheists because the probability of life simply originating by itself is nonsensical. Hear what I'm saying? So the gospel says you were made by God. There's a purpose to life. But the gospel also tells us bad news. You've got to understand the bad news before you can appreciate the good news. So we say, what do you want first? The good news or the bad news? Give me the bad news. Oh, the bad news is that we're sinners. The Bible says we're sinners and we're condemned to die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You and I are born with a ticket. And the ticket says you're sentenced to death. We are all on death row. But the good news is this, that the Creator says, I'm not only the judge, I'm not only the executioner, I'm your Father, I'm your Creator, and I love you, and you are inexpressibly important to me. I love you, and I'm not happy to live without you. And so the Bible says, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There are two stages here, perishing or having everlasting life. So I'm born to perish, but through Christ I'm born to live. And if I come to Christ and truly believe in him because of his goodness and because of his death for my sins, that he will accept me and he'll forgive me and he'll take me back into his kingdom. And one day I'm going to live for a trillion, billion, billion, zillion years and there'll be no end to it and every year is going to be better. John, some of the things that we're going Goodness. to talk about, it is. It's mm. a great message. Goodness. And some of the things we're going to talk about all relate back to what the gospel is. Yes. Knowing that, are there false gospels out there? Yes, there are false gospels. Is it important for us to name names? Is it important for us to say, well, this religion is false, this, be, this, this particular movement is false, or is it more important for us to simply talk about the specific issues? Dave, I think if people ask, if they ask me specific questions, mm -hmm. I will endeavor to be quite honest with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some very bad characteristics and one of them is that I, I have the awful characteristic which I inherited from my Australian parents that I normally say what I believe. I would not make a very good politician. <laughs> I would last for one millisecond, a nanosecond. I believe if people ask us specific questions and those questions are important to them, we ought to be decent and honest enough to tell them. Uh, but then at the same time, we don't need to be nasty. We don't need mm. to build up what is right by attacking people and mm. pulling them down. Speaking the truth in love. Yes, speak the truth in love. Counterfeit Gospels. How would they differ from the Gospel? Oh, by about a billion light years. Mm. Shall we mention some? There's the Counterfeit Gospel of the New Age. Millions in America, this is the country of the new age. That's not the worship of the God outside of you, the one great eternal self-existent God who made us and who says you're a sinner mm -hmm. and only the blood of my son can save you. But the new age says, hey, you're, you're a God yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you pray, you pray to the God inside mm -hmm. and you do a lot of meditating. And you know, you're really, all you've got to do is develop the goodness inside you. Now, that's, that is fiction. 
That is a, a myth. And people who follow that ultimately are going to become very, very disillusioned, even if it has all the glitz of Hollywood. And it does. A lot of Hollywood stars are into that stuff. That's because they do not have an intelligent understanding of the Bible. So that's one of them. The New Age. And there are others. What would you say to the person who says, now wait a minute. There are a lot of religions out there, and they have so many good things in them. Mm -hmm. Why can't they all, in their own way, point you toward God? Because I would say this to them, Dave, and this is an idea that many people will find quite objectionable. Mm -hmm. Because I believe the truth is truth, and lies are lies. Now, some people have the idea. Hitler even said, if you tell a lie long enough, loud enough, you know, keep telling it, shout it real loud, people are going to believe it. We've seen that here in this country. We've seen this in every country where people, politicians and other people will come out and tell out and out lies and they'll say it enough that people forget that they're telling lies and people will become so gullible they'll say, oh, I think that's right. I believe the truth is truth. Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. I believe that lies are lies that lead us down to darkness and into a state of lostness. Therefore, I believe that we should discover the truth. And Jesus said, your word is truth. This is the truth. I believe, Dave, and this is something that people, some people today who are tied up with the New Age don't want to know, and that is this, the truth can be objectively defined. Truth is not relative and truth is not subjective. Mm. Truth is not what Dave Dino feels is truth. Truth is not what John Carter feels is truth. If I look at this handsome table and if I am so blind as to say this table is made out of gold leaf, mm. it doesn't turn it into gold leaf even if I say it loud and long. Right. It is a wood veneer that we got at a discount store. <laughs> so we must discover truth. And truth is found in this book. And this book can be shown to be reliable and true through the evidence of archaeology, Bible prophecy, and by experience that comes when you read it. John, let's talk about something that's in the book. Mm. The Second Coming. Can we talk about some more false gospels? I if was, you want. I was only starting to get warmed up on oh, that day. I, the New Age is a false gospel. Legalism is a false gospel. Legalism is something that happens in the church. Oh, that's, that's, where, it's, that's, where, it's, that's where it operates. Give hmm. us an example of legalism. That's the, that's the fortress of legalism. Okay. What people think they're saved because of their own personal piety. Ah. Uh, they're people who are haughty, spiritual, very spiritual, very proud. They put down everybody else. When sinners come to church, including them, they don't see themselves as sinners. But if somebody comes in and has a different haircut or dresses slightly different to them, they say, oh, you're not as good as we are. And unless we can change the way you dress and all the rest of it, we don't want you around here. That's the religion of the Pharisee. They were the people who crucified Christ, who got rid of him. That's legalism. The tendency of the proud human heart to save itself by works of merit. Legalism. Mm -hmm. Perfectionism that says God won't have you until you're a perfect people. Until you're a perfect peop person. And many children who are, who are brought up in homes where the parents are perfectionistic turn out to be complete rebels and they hate God and they hate the church because their parents were saying, God won't love you until you're good enough. And so they're saying, we won't love you mm. till you're good enough. But the good news of the gospel is that God loves sinners. Jesus received sinners. Mm. He was the friend of sinners and he takes us in his arms because he loves us, mm -hmm. not because we're goody-goodies. Mm -hmm. That's the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. The good news of the gospel is not the good news about us or the church. It's the good news about God. Now let's go to the second question. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> this is something in the book that we're talking about. Give us an idea of what is talked about, what is meant by the second coming. The Bible says when God starts something, he's going to finish it. God mm -hmm. may seem to be in no hurry 
but God has a perfect time for everything. Jesus said in John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Jesus said he would come again. When you read the prophecies of the Bible, it teaches that Christ is going to come personally, the same Jesus. He's going to come visibly. Revelation says every eye is going to see him. He's going to come and raise the dead. He's going to come and translate the saints. He's going to come to take his people home to a better world. That's the hope of the world. That's the hope of the Christian. There are words within Christendom that when those who are not Christians hear them, they don't understand them. I know. Maybe I'm saying some now. But some of those words are not even necessarily understood by those within the church. One of those words is rapture. Yes. What is the rapture? Well, now, Dave, you're probably asking the wrong person because I don't believe in the secret rapture. Ah. Ah, this is the first time you said you want to find out what mm -hmm. this That's right. guy believes. I told you I'm going to tell you what I believe. Mm -hmm. And you may say after I've got through this, what on earth am I interviewing this heretic <laughs> for? <laughs> because you come from a big Christian station yes. here in the Southland, a great station. Dave, there is nothing secret about the coming of Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 4, and it was not this idea of the secret rapture only came into the church in the last 150 years. It wasn't held by any person before then. The Bible says, Paul says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the uh, trumpet call of God. You know, there's a trumpet, blah, 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 with the trumpet. You know, it's pretty noisy. One person who was trying to defend the secret rapture when he read that verse, he said, it's the noisiest verse in the Bible. It's not the verse I was looking for. And then it says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Bless your heart, you're going to go out to Forest Lawn and people are going to be getting up everywhere. People are trying to tell me this is secret. They tell me that when Jesus comes, the saints are raptured home secretly. There's a plane going along, you see, all of a sudden the plane goes out of control because the pilot is gone and somebody else is gone and cars are careering mm -hmm. down the highway. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it. I believe that the coming of Christ is going to be visible it's going to be audible. It's going to be noisy. And then it says in the next verse, then we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I must hasten to say that some of the finest Christians that I know believe in the secret rapture. But I must be honest and tell you I do not believe it because I cannot find it in the Bible. That's my problem, or perhaps it's theirs. Would it be fair to say that it really is not quite so important as to how it happens as it is to the fact that it is going to happen? And that you be ready for it? Right. Oh, I'm sure, Dave. You see how much we agree on. We agree on the fundamentals because we agree on the gospel. Right. If you know Christ today, if you are saved today, that if Christ comes today, you're going to be ready. Right. But you can have all your theology worked out perfectly. You can be a great systematic theologian, and you can end up going to hell. The people who nailed Christ to the cross and the people who hated him most back there were the priests mm -hmm. and the theologians, mm -hmm. the Sadducees. You know why they're called Sadducees? They were sad, you see. Yeah, they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. <laughs> The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection or the supernatural. They believed this was the only life. That's why they're sad, you see. So they're the Sadducees and the Pharisees. These were the theologians, the scribes, and they had their theology great because they thought salvation was discovered through what you know. The Bible teaches that salvation is discovered through whom you know. And this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, Jesus said in John 17. So the most important thing is to know Christ and be ready for the second coming now. Another one of those funny words of the church. Mm. Tribulation. 
Now, there's a lot of debate on the tribulation as to when it's going to happen. I think it started and it's now. In, and, well, it's, uh, people say it is in relation Since to the rapture. Since I've been trying to, to buy rapture. this evangelism center, uh, I've been going through tribulation. A great deal of tribulation. Yeah. It, and they, they link the rapture and the tribulation together, and mm. we get, we get pre-trib and post-trib and yeah. uh, pan-trib. It's uh, all going to pan out in the yeah, end. I know. I mean, what is the tribulation, and, and, and where does it mm. happen, Do if you, it happens? I know. Uh, Dave, you see, uh, you may be coming to me, you're coming to me very open-minded, and, and you are a wonderful Christian brother, and I appreciate you ever so much. But we may have different backgrounds, so let me tell you what I believe. Mm -hmm. And when I say what I believe, even though I may sound dogmatic, you know why I sound dogmatic? It's because I probably am. <laughs> it's because I believe what I believe. I doubt what I doubt, and I believe what I believe. Somebody once said that uh, anybody who does not believe in something mm -hmm. will believe in anything. Yeah, and if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Uh, yeah, isn't that true? Yeah. 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 So let's get back to this tribulation. Now, okay. it is believed by some of my dear evangelical friends, whom I love in Christ, that be, when the Lord comes, the righteous are raptured home to glory. Mm -hmm. You see, they're, they're mm -hmm. driving down the road, mm -hmm. the man's driving the car, and his wife's sitting there, and he's talking to her, he says, Honey, honey, <laughs> <laughs> she's gone. What is he doing there? Now, wait a minute. Why is it always the woman that gets to go to heaven? Well, because I'm trying to get the ladies on side. Haven't you, you seen go. what the politicians have been trying to do in the elections? That's you right. See? So, anyhow, so one is taken and the other left. The Bible says one is taken and the other left, and that is true. But then they say, the saints go home to heaven, and the wicked stay here on the earth, mm -hmm. and then, wacko, mm -hmm. the diddlio. Mm -hmm. That's when the great tribulation starts. Mm -hmm. And it goes for three and a half years, and there's great trouble over in Jerusalem, and, uh, the sacri and they have rebuilt the Jewish temple. Then the sacrifice and the oblation ceases. They stop, uh, stop the sacrifices. And then after a period of time, Christ comes back again. Mm -hmm. You see, so he comes three times. Mm. When I read the Bible, Dave, particularly in the prophecies of Matthew chapter 24 given by our blessed Lord, it appears very plain to me that the tribulation happens to the saints while they are here on this earth. The Bible says there shall be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world, and except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days are going to be shortened. When I read my Bible, the elect are God's people. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's not going to do the elect one bit of good if they're up in heaven, but God is going to shorten the tribulation down here on this earth for the sake of the elect. And then it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun is going to be dark, and the moon is not going to give us light, the stars are going to fall from heaven. Then they're going to see the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, and he shall send forth his angel, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven to the other. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus said the very words, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, Dave, could I put a little aside in this, this little exposition I'm giving, mm -hmm. with your permission, and say that the idea of the tribulation, or the church escaping the tribulation, while it plays very well here in these great United States, it doesn't play very well in Russia. They've had a great tribulation in the 20th century. Seventy million of them tortured and ah. put to death. And did you know some of them were taught this idea of the rapture, that the rapture would come and there'd be no tribulation for them because the tribulation would be for the wicked. And that some of the Russian Christians had opportunity to flee from their persecutors. They didn't do so because they said, the saints are not going to go through a tribulation. Now this idea seems to play very well here in North America, but it doesn't play to Christians in other parts of the world. I believe it is the purpose of God for the living church, for the elect to go through the tribulation for a time of purification. Then the Lord is going to come. John, we've titled today's program, Why I Am What I Am. And there are various aspects of the Christian faith that we can 
look at, and within the church, we can have some areas of disagreement and have some grace with one another. However, there is one issue within Christendom that many believe you cannot vary from, you cannot have a difference of opinion on, and that is the Trinity. What is the Trinity? Dave, the Trinity is a word that is used by theologians, not found in the Bible, to describe God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You can find a ton of evidence that teaches that the Father is divine, that the Son is divine, and that the Holy Spirit is divine. We do not worship three gods, we worship one God. We are monotheists. We worship one God who is demonstrated in three living, separate personalities who are one in substance. Mm -hmm. And may I say something about your comment on religious tolerance? Mm -hmm. I believe this with all my heart. One of the greatest sins of Christendom is bigotry. We mm -hmm. find it everywhere, mm -hmm. bigotry. I can remember once back in Australia, an old German farmer came to my meetings and he said to me after one of my meetings, Pastor Carter, I used to be a bigoted Lutheran. A bigoted Lutheran? Oh, well, I have heard of the Missouri Lutherans and you know, I didn't know much about this, but he said, I'm a bigoted Lutheran. He meant a bigoted Lutheran. Oh. He said, I used to be a bigoted oh. Lutheran. Well, I said, look, I can tell you, my friend, you're not alone. They're a bigoted Adventist. <laughs> They're a bigoted Baptist. They're a bigoted Catholics. There are lots of bigoted people. We ought to hate the sin of bigotry. And we ought to stand firm on the great cardinal fundamentals of the faith, but we should not hate people mm -hmm. for the love of God because they dare to think differently to what we are. That is very ungodly and unlike our Lord. Let's see if I can get you in a little bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. The subject is the Sabbath. Yes, yes. Let's see if I can get you in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> Keep going. Can you define the Sabbath for us to begin with? Yes. Let's start right there. Yes, the Sabbath means rest. The Sabbath is divine rest for human restlessness. Now, the Sabbath in terms of the church. Yes. A day of worship? Yes, indeed. And I, which day of the week? It's very, very simple. You know, I may not be too smart, but I can count to seven. <laughs> 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 now, when I, now, let me tell you simply what my faith is on this. Because this is important, that you and I understand each other. Mm -hmm because we're brothers in Christ. You represent this great outreach here in Southern California, which is touching hundreds of thousands, millions of lives over the airwaves. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that great station. I believe this, Dave, that in the scriptures, we can believe in these great teachings. I believe we can take the Bible as it, as it is. I believe that we're not saved by the law. That's important. I believe that we're saved by grace through faith alone. We're not saved by our success in keeping the commandments. I do not believe that. See, that's legalism. Mm -hmm. But neither do I believe in antinomianism. And antinomianism is a very ancient heresy in the Christian church. Anti against nomos the law. That's the attitude that says that the law of God is abolished. Uh. Every Christian church, every church, including the Roman Catholic Church, the Baptist, all the Reformed churches, the, then you have the Baptist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church, my mother church, the Church of England, the Presbyterian Church, Congregational Church, they all teach the perpetuity of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Now, here in America, people are very much for the Ten Commandments. Christians say, let's get them back in the school. Mm -hmm. Let's get them back in the school. The problem has happened because we don't have the Ten Commandments in the school. Billy Graham's son said, after that terrible tragedy at that high school, what was mm -hmm. it called now, you know? Columbine. Columbine High School. He said, schools can become dangerous places when the Ten Commandments are removed. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, the separation of church and state. I'm just saying he was right that when you don't respect the Ten Commandments, people are in big trouble. I believe that a person who is saved by grace through faith will want to honor God by keeping the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Now, when I come to the Ten Commandments, which is found over here in Exodus 20, it says, remember the Sabbath day. It doesn't say, remember, don't kill, because we do remember that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say, remember... 
uh, not to commit adultery. Most of us remember that. Mm -hmm. But it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six mm -hmm. days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. In Genesis chapter 2, before sin came into the world, long before the nation of the Jews, God instituted the Sabbath. And the Bible says the Lord rested on the seventh day, the Lord blessed the seventh day, the Lord made it holy, He set it apart. We believe it's the Lord's day. So we believe that the Sabbath is the day that is kept by the ancient people of the Bible, the Jewish people, mm -hmm. by our blessed Lord who was a Sabbath keeper, mm -hmm. by whom we also we believe, I'm not trying to be contentious or argumentative, but we believe there is the clearest evidence in the Bible that our blessed Lord and the disciples and the apostles kept the seventh day Sabbath. And therefore, while I do not want to be different for the sake of being different, I want to be true to the Lord. Now you say, what about people that don't keep the Sabbath? Do you see them as being doing something. No, no, no. Not one word of condemnation. But I must be what I must be because I must do what my conscience tells me to do. Perhaps the question then would be, is the keeping of the Sabbath a matter of a person's salvation? A matter of a person is a very good question, Dave. And it's sort of one of those curly ones that, you know, mm -hmm. have some bowlers throw underarm and they've got all yeah. these curly ones. But, you know, I've had this bat in my hands for a few years now, so I'm ready for that curly one day. Um, I could say to any person who asks that question, is the keeping of the nine commandments, does that have anything to do with a person's salvation? Mm. Those that shall have no other gods before me, shall not make unto you any graven image, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We'll miss out the fourth one because that's the one we're talking about. <laughs> Honor your father and your mother, all those commandments. You shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery. All Christians who are saved by grace say that grace does not excuse them from obedience to nine commandments. My argument is that grace does not excuse me from the ten commandments. I do not believe that I am saved by my works, but I believe my works show that I am saved. I do not believe that law keeping is the way to heaven. I believe that commandment keeping is the fruitage of coming to know God. Mm. I believe that obedience is the fruitage of faith. And as one poet said, I would not work my soul to save, for this my Lord hath done. Mm. But I would work like any slave for the love of God's dear son. So that's why I believe in keeping the commandments by God's grace. Not in order to be saved, but because I am saved. Last question on this subject. Mm. View of those who choose to worship on Sunday. Yes. What is the question? Is that, is that's that, it. That, Your view. Oh, of my those. view on this. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, I love them. I love them. Uh, it, probably be similar to your view, a Baptist view on a Methodist who doesn't believe in baptism. Mm. See, the Baptists say you've got to be baptized to be saved. Many of them say that. Mm. I don't believe this. No. I baptize by immersion, but I don't mm. believe that you've got to, a person's got to be baptized to be saved. I believe that baptism there is, a, is showing that you have been saved. You say it's a fruitage of salvation. Mm -hmm. I believe it's exactly the same with the Sabbath, and I know a great multitude of wonderful Sunday-keeping Christians I can mention them on this television program. They're famous across America. I believe they're living according to the truth as they understand it. And God is the judge, and God knows the heart. God knows what our intent is. And it's not my prerogative to judge any man, because God knows the heart, and God knows what my intent is. But God would have all of us to follow his word according to the dictates of our conscience and to love each other. The title of our program is Why I Am What I Am, and we're touching on various mm. aspects of the Christian faith and various aspects of your faith and your yes. understanding of the faith. And you've already led me into the question I wanted to go to next, and that is the question of baptism. Mm. What is it? What does it represent? How should it be performed? And when? Well, when I was a little boy, my mother took me off to the Catholic priest at the insistence of my father, who's 
grand, whose grandfather's name was Timothy Tui. So what mm -hmm. else could an Irishman do but have his boy, you know, baptized in Holy Mother Catholic mm -hmm. Church? And so as a little boy, I went along, and the Catholic priest put a few drops of water on my forehead and said, I baptize thee in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. It didn't do me any harm, I think, and didn't do me any good either, mm -hmm. because the Bible talks about the baptism of adults. When Jesus was about 30 years of age, he was baptized not because he was a sinner, but because he was baptized to show us an example and because he identified himself with the guilty human race. The Bible says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. The Bible says, go and baptize them, teaching them to obey all things. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. A little baby can't believe. So I believe that the person who ought to be baptized is a person who has repented. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 3 there in that vicinity, it says repent and be baptized. Little baby can't repent, it can't believe, it can't be taught the great fundamentals of the gospel. But when a person is old enough, and I have baptized now about 20,000 people. Mm. So when a person, by, by immersion, mm -hmm. so when a person truly believes, and when a person has been taught the gospel, and when a person has repented of his sins, then that person is ready to be baptized. And then he becomes an official child of God and a member of the church. When you and I talk, mm. quite often, mm. this next issue comes up. You always find a way to get back to it. So oh, I, I know do? It's a, it's a passionate issue in your life. <laughs> and it is the issue of the separation of the church and state. I thought you were bringing that up. No, oh, this is I'm one that I keep hearing you talk about time and again. Now, my question is this. We hear a lot of talk uh, about freedom of religion yeah. and how the government today is trying to, through various laws and through various decisions of the Supreme Court, to really solidify this freedom of religion. And yet, many Christians are saying it's gone overboard and what they're trying to do is force freedom from religion separation of church and state. What is it and, and how do you see it being worked out in our lives? I believe it's a very simple and a very complex issue. Mm. <laughs> Just like my question. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let me give a little bit of history. One of the blackest chapters in the history of the world was the chapter of the Dark Ages. Mm. That's when the Roman Catholic Church in the Dark Ages, and they admit this now, set up the Inquisition. The Pope has given a sort of apology about this. You know, what they did to the Jews and what they did to Catholics and what they did to Protestants. Mm -hmm. Because the vast number of people, the vast majority of people who were tortured in the Inquisition were Roman Catholics. Mm. Roman Catholics who dared to question the local Pope. Wow. And so because they missed out a Mass, they were taken and they were stretched on the rack. And this happened not to a few hundred people. This happened to several million, possibly up to 50 million people were butchered in the Dark Ages over a thousand years. Whoa. And it happened because of the union of church and state. The union of church and state. Mm. The church back there didn't put a single person to death, didn't put one person on the rack, never put one person on the, in the Einvirgin or any of these monstrous things of torture. Mm -hmm. But the church would condemn the person in the Inquisition and then the church would hand the person over to the state. Ah. And the state carried out the torture. And so you had a marriage of church and state. And history tells us, Dave, whenever you have a, a union of church and state, there you have persecution. And that is why I am opposed to it, to my back teeth. Hmm. When the Puritans came over here, they came over here to get away from that awful system of the Inquisition. They were only over here for a while and some Catholics came over and so the Puritans said, well, we're going to persecute them because they don't think the same as we do. And then another religious group said, well, we're going to get the state and we're going to do away with the Baptists. And so churches down through the years have, it, have attempted to get hold of the power of the state to enforce their own religious dogma. And when they do that, those churches become part and parcel of Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 17, the Antichrist is described as a church that is joined to the state. That's pretty scary. I do not want to be part of any organization that instead of having the power of the Holy Spirit has the power of the U.S. government or some other government behind it. So that's, that's one answer from history. Number two, while the U.S. government should not set up organized religion and foster organized religion or foster 
the teachings of Christ or anything. You know, I hear people who say, good Christian people, they say, this is a Christian nation and Christ is the head of our country and we're going to enforce our religion. What are they going to do to the Jews? What are they going to do to unbelievers? Are they going to put them on the rack? Are they going to take us back to the Dark Ages? That's antichrist. That should be opposed with everything that is within us. Dave, I'm opposed to that. But I do not believe that the government should be engaged in a warfare against the church and the imposition of secular ideas that make war against the faith of our fathers. And I believe that in America today, in some areas, that is happening where you have humanists who are educators uh, who will have everything you can think of taught in the schools. Homosexuality. They can teach that in the schools. I know. They can pass out condoms and say, hey, use these. They can, they can take our little children and try to say that certain sexual acts that are condemned in the Bible are, are okay. Mm-hmm. But they say, now, no, no, no. You cannot, of course, have any time at all for a reading of a text of the Bible. Now, that is a terrible twisting of what is right, I believe. So I would hope that I take a balanced position. I believe that the government ought to keep out a religion, should not foster one religion over another. It is not in the business of making Christians. It's in the business of running the secular part of the government. I believe that. But I believe that the government would do well to foster the growth of Christianity or any religion. By foster, I mean stay out of the way. Mm. Let them get on with their work and not hinder them by senseless laws that would cripple their progress. The other side of this might be that a person would take the issue of separation of church and state and say that Christians should not bring their faith over into politics. Well, if I, that would be impossible to do. If I was elected as the President of the United States, which is not very likely, <laughs> but I would be what I am. I would read my Bible. Mm. I would pray to my God. And I would hope that in all the decisions I made, I would re- reflect as much as I could the faith that guides me, because your faith is a vital part of you. I hope that we have people who are in positions of authority, a people who have a holy respect for God, have a reverence for his word. That is when the country is best served. Mm -hmm. We don't want communists running the country, for goodness sake, Mm -hmm. do we? Not that I'm suggesting that that would ever happen, but I I want to see people who are God-fearing people. John, it is said that there is a book in our homes, one Mm. book above all other books, that can, when you open its pages, that can tell you the state of a person's faith. It's not necessarily the book you may think of. Mm. This book that I'm talking about is your checkbook. Oh, goodness. You go in, you open the checkbook, Mm -hmm. and you see what the person's involvement is in their church. Mm. The issue is tithing. Yes. What is tithing? Is it 10%? Is it more than 10%? Is it okay Mm. to be less than 10%? And is it uh, necessary? Yes, it is necessary. It is taught in the Bible. It's an interesting thing that people who say that the Sabbath is abolished because it's a part of the Old Testament (laughs) are very firm supporters of tithing. Uh Maybe because it's got something to do with money. (laughs) (laughs) A tithe is a tenth. The Bible says in Malachi, bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me in this if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out so much blessing that there won't be room enough to receive it. Jesus said, talking about tithing, these things you should have done. The Bible says those who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Churches should not be engaged in raffles or bingo or any of those foolish things to raise money. They ought to be involved in tithing. Every person ought to tithe. And not only tithe. The Bible says tithes and offerings. So we should, when we return, we don't 
sort of just give your tithe, you return it. It's God's. Mm -hmm. The Bible says the tithe is sacred to the Lord. That's in the Old Testament. In fact, that's in the Pentateuch. That's in the book of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the same area as the Ten Commandments. Uh -huh. The same area as the Sabbath. So it says the tithe is the Lord's. I believe in tithe. I tithe. My family, we encourage every person to tithe. We encourage every member in the church to tithe because by so doing, we are showing honor and respect to God and we're making it possible for the gospel to be preached. If every American in America, if every Christian in America, not every American, every Christian were to say, I'm going to accept the principle of tithing. I'm going to tithe. We'd have no money with funds for Russia. Today we're struggling to do that work there. Mm. Terrible struggle because people are not faithful to God. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that God will bless the person who tithes. He will make nine-tenths go much further with his blessing than ten-tenths without it. We only have a few moments left. We've and had I, a good time, haven't we? We have had a wonderful mm -hmm. time. And there are other questions that we'll get together and we'll ask again. And we'll touch on some other subjects in another program. Yes. But I want to bring us back around to this idea of God's big family. I think one of the most uh, bigoted, bigoted <laughs> <laughs> ideas is that I and mine are the only ones that God is going to save. Many churches believe this. Mm. There are Baptists who say, well, only God's going to save the Baptists. There are Catholics who say, and that seems to be the view of the present Pope, that the only true church is mm. made up of the Catholics. You say, mm -hmm. we're the only true church. Mm -hmm. Then I know Adventists who say, well, we're, we're, we're the remnant. Uh, we're the only true church. So we're the only ones who are going to make it. Dave, God's family is made up of all those true believers in Christ who have come to him in true faith have accepted him as Lord and Savior, have repented of their sins, and according to the light that God has given them, follow the dictates of their conscience. God has got a big family. Mm. My friends Danny and Linda Shelton, they're a part of God's family. I believe that Mother Teresa of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. holds apart from my theology. I believe she was an earnest believer in God, in Jesus, followed the light as God gave it to her. She was a part of God's family. Mm -hmm. I believe that you're a part of God's family. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God is working to bring us all closer together into a knowledge of his word. And I believe that as true Christians humbly walk before God and keep their minds open and love each other, God will be able to take away the differences and bring them into a wonderful heart. Your congregation worships on Saturday morning yes. in a new location mm. in Arcadia. Yes. Tell us where that is. Yes, gladly, because I want everybody to come who's watching. 100 West Duarte Road, Arcadia, California. You take the 210 freeway, mm -hmm. then you take the Santa Anita. Mm -hmm. Santa Anita. This is all new to me, you see. We haven't been here long. Mm. Santa Anita. And you go down about a mile past those wonderful parks and golf course, and you mm -hmm. take a right. And where this beautiful building down there, you will see our sign up. People are welcome to come Saturday morning. We have gospel songs and scripture songs, and we praise the Lord. We just have a really good time. Well, it's a wonderful fellowship of believers. It's a very warm Thank fellowship you. of believers. It's a place to come to grow in Christ. Thank you. It's a place for you to bring your family so that they can grow in Christ. Thank you. Dave. John, thank you for answering some of the tough questions of the And faith. thank you for being such a good friend to the Carter Report and the Community Adventist Fellowship because we're all in this together to hasten the coming of the Lord and at last to be saved with our dear ones in the kingdom. God bless you, Dave. Thank you very much. Folks, we invite you to stand with us in this ministry. If you'd like to come and join us, if you'd like to write to us, first of all, let me give you again the address for the church. It's 100 West Duarte Road in Arcadia, about a mile south of the 210 freeway, just off of Santa Anita. If you'd like to write to us here at the Carter Report, we invite you to do so and stand with us in this way. We are located at Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 
91358. And you'll see that address on your screen. Again, that's Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Thank you for joining us today.